Hello, this is Pitboard and I am your host Sam Hall. You join us today for a very sombre and different edition of the show as the motorsport world comes to terms with the tragic events of the weekend at Spa-Francorchamps. On the second lap of Saturday's feature race, several drivers were involved in an accident through Eau Rouge, up the hill and into Radion. The accident, which will not be graphically described here, resulted in the death of 22-year-old Frenchman Antoine Hubert and sees Juan Manuel Correa remain in a critical but stable condition in hospital after suffering two broken legs and a spinal injury. Before introducing my two panellists for today's show, I spoke to F1's digital presenter and former GP2 commentator Will Buxton, who gave an insight into the mood change within the paddock in the immediate aftermath of the incident. Um, obviously, it was in- incredibly sad, and um, the, the, the mood shifted almost immediately. We were concluding post-qualifying interviews, um, and I was actually standing quite close to, to Lewis Hamilton as he was being interviewed by uh, some other TV broadcasters, and... Um, he had a full view of the screen as the crash happened and the, the, his reaction, the way his face dropped, um, let everybody know the, the, the severity of, of what he thought he'd seen. And, uh, and what we all knew that we had seen um, as, it, as, as it happened, those kind of accidents are not usual. They're not regular even uh, on, on racetracks like this. And I think everybody realized from the moment that the race was not restarted, um, that it was something incredibly severe and, and, and tragically the, the news came through that it was the worst that it could possibly be. Um, it's something that we've not had to contend with at an F1 weekend since 1995, uh, the death of Marco Campos in a Formula 3000 race. Um, so for a lot of people in this place, it is the first time that, 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 that they've they've had to cope with with losing somebody in that situation um, on event, and it, it, it's it's a gut punch. Um, it is the, the sad reality that that this is part and parcel of our sport. It is what makes these guys heroes. It is it is the the, the the risk that creates the reward and we we know that and we appreciate that and we see the words on the back of our past that motor racing is dangerous but it, it it's very rare that the true reality and the true gravity of that danger uh, makes itself so viciously apparent um, is it something that I mean, last time we met, we were standing on the grid at Brands Hatch. We were talking about Paddock Hill and the challenges about that. Is the safety of motor racing in general something that we've become too blasé about? Because the car, the drivers and the cars can survive these horrible, huge smashes, and we just take it for granted that they'll walk out. No, no. Uh, the quest for safety in motorsports isn't a done deal. It is a constantly evolving thing uh, every year, every weekend. The, you know, the, the FIA, the, the teams um, in in all forms, all spheres of motorsport are looking at ways that they can make racing safer, be that the circuits, be that the cars, be that the barriers, whatever it might be. They're, they're always searching for ways to make it safer. But the reality is motor racing will never be 100% safe you know but for a tenth of a second but for two inches in another direction accidents turn on the flip of a coin from being survivable to not and and that is the nature of our sport that is the nature of what motorsport is and has always been because in the midst of these incredibly safe incredibly robust vehicles machines are human beings and there comes a point at which the human body simply cannot deal with the extremities that it's it's put through. And just one final one. Um, obviously, there's track safety and car safety. It's something that's always talked about, as you say. Is there a danger that there could be an instant reaction, a, a gut reaction that's for the future of Spa or even for the future of these chassis of F2 cars in the immediate aftermath of this accident? No, no, no. I, I, I don't think now's the, sort of really the time to, to discuss that or to try and guess 
um, you know, what, what, what the, the outcome uh, will be. Um, you know, obviously investigations will take place. Obviously, Delara will, you know, will look at the chassis. You know, they will piece together every single part of what happened in that accident. Um, and it, it's an accident. You know, accidents are accidents. They are unforeseeable circumstances. It's worth, um, I think, pointing out that, you know, the Delara with what they've done with GP2 going into Formula 2 and Formula 3 and GP3, you know, it's been 15 years that that, that championship has existed and, and we have witnessed some truly horrible uh, incidents that years before people would not have walked away from. And it's just tragic that in this circumstance and in this situation, a phenomenally talented kid with his whole career ahead of him the reigning gp3 and will forever be now the gp3 champion because gp3 no longer exists that he was taken from us um that i think is is the only thing that anybody is thinking about at the moment investigations will happen uh lessons i'm sure will be learned changes may be made but for now you know all that anybody's thinking of is antoine his his family his friends um for the Formula 2 paddock and, and everyone down there because they're hurting like hell. Thank you for this. It's a very difficult time, so thank you for taking the time out to speak to us, Will. No uh, worries, man. Very thank much you. appreciated. Join me to give their thoughts on the comments of Will and the incident itself are Downforce Radio Communications Officer Alex Goldschmidt and Formula 2 Editor for the Checkered Flag, Aaron Gillard. Welcome. Evening. Evening, guys. Um... Obviously, we've just heard the comments of Will Buxton. Um, Alex, if you can just give me your initial thoughts on what he said, um, if there's anything that you disagree with, um, with what he said, or whether you think he's spot on. Uh, I, th- I think realistically that with the comments from Will were, were completely 100% spot on. You know, he works in that paddock, which is very much like a family. I know several people that work in there, such as, Crash F1's digital editor, Luke Smith, um, Dan Paddock, who works with Mercedes, uh, amongst other people. And um, I've known Will since 2014, and he is just 100% on the button with this because we have to realise that these are our modern-day gladiators, the likes of Antoine Hubert, the likes of Gilles Bianchi, who we've lost, um, unfortunately, uh, amongst others. It's very interesting to hear from someone that is part of that family and he has been a part of that family especially when f2 was formerly known as gp2 as uh you know communications director and then the man that started doing commentary for them uh, off of one particular uh opportunity um and to hear will's comments he wears his heart on his sleeve does mr buxton and i have got nothing but uh, admiration for him taking the time to 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 give his comments on how everything was and, and, and to see that he was there actually when Lewis was being interviewed, that was a key telling point in how you, the, even the defending five time Formula One world champion was, uh, had a jaw drop moment as well. And Aaron, obviously you were actually in the paddock um, last year when he won his GP3 champion, as Will says, he will be the GP3 champion forever now. Um, what were your initial reactions to the news and obviously the crash itself? It's something we don't want to go into detail about, but what, what were your impressions? Absolutely. I mean, when we saw the first crash happen, it was spectacular in a way. And um, we knew something was up when F when, when it was red flagged immediately and the race was canceled that, you know, we hoped that it was, everybody was going to be okay. And then the news broke out and I was, broken i was shocked by it because anton is a, a character in the f in the f2 paddock and formerly in the gp3 paddock um he was very likable had a great sense of humor loved his bikes everyone got along with antoine and the team loved uh, arden loved him everyone loved him and that he always you know whenever he came into the paddock he was always smiling you always could tell when he was in obviously from his glasses uh, a unique look from in the paddock in and he was he was very loved in that and of course what happened this weekend i mean it's a great you know we lost a shining talent in there of course last year won the gp3 championship the last ever gp3 championship uh with a round to spare in abu dhabi uh 
the team at the gala celebrated it like like none other in that hand. He, he was a, he's a great driver, fantastic speed. It took a it took him time to get used to that because of course he was his second year GB3. But ever since he won the title, he accelerated that in F2. He was phenomenal. He's been phenomenal winning two races in that and we've lo- we've lost a great we've lost a great man and a great driver in this series. And Alex, we've just heard the thoughts of Aaron on Antoine as a driver. Um, did you have any experiences with him? I know you do a lot of work with karting. Had you? Was he someone that had ever crossed paths with you? Uh, unfortunately, not because um, with my travels within the karting community, you get to see all these different people from different walks of life, so respective of budgets, because everyone in the karting community is uh, one big happy family. But there is one person from Downforce that has also. Uh, met Antoine and that is uh, our very own chairman Jake Sanson who's currently at the uh, IAMI Euro Series uh, finale at Sudbury um, which um, quite poignantly is, is in Antoine, Antoine's home country of France um, but there was some very I think um, just looking at social media over the, the you know the weekend obviously after Antoine's unfortunate passing through the tragic circumstances um, one of the big things is that uh, Charles Leclerc, Max Verstappen and Antoine Hubert all competed at the same time in karting. And there's this fantastic picture of Charles with his arm around Antoine's shoulder. And obviously Charles, um, um, it was with, with Charles where he, doesn't, he didn't have the short back and sides that we have now, but sort of like the, the long sort of French mullet that we see on a, long, a lot of young French karters nowadays. Um, but just to show uh, that sort of respect and uh, humility. Um, but I've never met Antoine, um, to be honest with you. I Just by, you know, obviously Aaron's tweets uh, this weekend have sort of brought a tear to my eye because obviously this is a guy that you know, Aaron went over to Abu Dhabi for the GP3 finale when Antoine was the last ever GP3 champion. And um, I think there was something that Aaron said that really stuck in my mind is that the whole team was celebrating with Antoine and they put a huge mixture of alcohol into it and, and they were just celebrating in the way that they wanted to. And Aaron, I think Aaron, if I remember correctly, you took a swing and you went as well, but they were, they were having the times of their life at the, the, the war ceremony in Abu Dhabi. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't nice, but I mean, it didn't matter. Um, they were having the time of their lives. They were celebrating like the party just started and it was like 12 o'clock in the evening. Uh, in the morning and that so they they pied hard at that then and rightly so and realistically um aaron to you first where could hubert have ended up in the motorsport um fraternity where could he have ended up how high could he have gone because he yes he was the gp3 champion and he was doing very well in and one of the poorer teams on the grid let's not beat about the bush arden aren't the biggest of teams in f2 um, and he'd got those two race wins. Realistically, I think he would have ended up in probably a better F2 seat next year. But could he have made that leap up to Formula 1 at some point with Renault or whoever he could have ended up being? Was that a possibility for him? There was certainly a possibility. I mean, if he bagged the seat uh, with a top F2 team such as ART or Dams, who did show a sign of interest to sign Hubert for next year uh, in a bid to sort of give him a chance to compete as a, as a, for the title. Um, it would have Renault started doing F1 programs with him along with Max Futrell and Guan Yu Zhou. Uh, over the past couple of months, circ- at circuits like Barcelona and Paul Ricard, just to give them a, sort of a taste of what Formula One is like with older cars. And then eventually they'll get to sort of the level where Jack Aiken is, where they'll get reserve driver roles, reserve driver roles and eventually maybe progress into Formula One. Um, Obviously, Hubert isn't hasn't got a, a big pot. Never had a big pot of cash. He was sort of a driver that had talent, but never had the budget to do that to sort of cement himself in a big seat as like with Arden now. But he was always had the talent that that gives big teams a chance, a showcase. Maybe we could sign him on and all that. And I think you know, at some point at the time, Renault were gonna Renault would have probably considered maybe looking into Formula One and maybe putting him to a seat somewhere or maybe even that uh, team in 2021 when uh, maybe one of the drivers ends up, when the driver's contracts and runs up and all that. Um, I definitely would have seen him 
maybe potential for Formula One at some point in his career. I mean, he was it was a talent that deserved over over the next few years a, a potentially earn a seat within the grid on that uh, in Formula One. And obviously, the best tribute, the most fitting tribute for Hubert was to go racing on Sunday. Um, obviously, Formula Two, the drivers, it it was too much from that from a purely emotional standpoint that sprint race was cancelled but the formula three and the formula one went on as well as the porsche super cup um and there was frustratingly another incident in the formula three where simul lost the rear going into blanchemon flat out high speed corner but the halo came to the rescue um Alex, the safety improvements that have been made in motorsport in general, especially open wheel racing recently, we've seen the good and the weak points this weekend, haven't we? Yes, with any motorsport weekend, there are trials and tribulations and we've had plenty of trials and uh, emotions this weekend. And Simo Laksanen's uh, you know, incident at Bloshimo was one where I think a lot of people were thinking, you know, th- there probably would have been some people having doubts, saying it's not going well at all this weekend. Well, that's uh, and I can understand people's opinions, people's emotions. Um, but the rate, you know, the, they would have wanted to have done the best thing because, yes, racing drivers are human, but they want to go out there and race. Of course, yes, you have to think of the likes of the whole of the F2 fraternity, including Antoine's teammate, uh, Colombian going to be his very own uh, Tatiana Calder with Alfa Romeo racing as a, as a, as a test and reserve driver. Um, you know, so there was a lot of emotion uh, in F2. But yeah, it was, it was very good to see that the introduction of the halo, despite the amount of people when it got introduced a couple of years ago, is doing its absolute, you know, he went under the barriers. Let's be honest, I'm not going to go into details, but he went in, under the barriers, and the halo did exactly what it meant to do, which was to protect Simo's upper body, especially his head and his neck areas, which are very vital parts. Um, and it just felt like, you know, a lot of people were, that those emotions were still raw from Antoine's passing yesterday. And obviously, uh, Juan Manuel Correa, who um, we'll get on to later on, who was involved in the accident, uh, on Saturday, but yeah, I mean the, the the safety aspect to see that Simo responded and went, yeah, I'm fine, and got out of the vehicle. And I have to give a big credit to the uh, the men and women in orange, the marshalling team, uh, who have been nothing if not exemplary this weekend, despite the difficulties of the tragedy with Antoine yesterday, and irrespective of what happened on Sunday, they are as much a part of the motorsport fa- uh, family fabric. Um, so, yeah, I mean, having the halo there on F3, F2, F1 is showing now that it is a tried and tested technology, albeit it being in the worst of circumstances. But I'm good. To, I'm glad to see that Simo's OK after everything. And uh, obviously in the F3, we did have some good races, uh, good, some good battles. We had Yuki Sonoda and Christian Lungard with Robert Schwartzman coming in towards the end, battling over second, third and fourth. And that battle, I can't help but think it was slightly sanitized with, with the thought of what had happened the day before. Um, but it, they weren't hold, they didn't hold back that much if they were holding back, did they Aaron? No, I mean, they all, it, I can understand from the driver's perspective, Obviously, what happened today? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, on Saturday, um, there, you have a lot of mixed emotions, and like I can understand from their perspective and that. And but they did, they did, they did what what Anton probably would have wanted. They wanted to go, they wanted to go racing, and they put up a good show. I'd say um, a few actions uh, over the over the race in that, and of course Yuki to uh, to Sonoda uh, performed well. Uh, in the race and a lot of action going on around the circuit. And that. I mean, I had a, I mean, I had a feeling when there was a, a few a- action packs at the beginning of the race where um, I think it was Alex Peroni and Devin Francesco were colliding and all that. I just felt that maybe it was it was it felt it felt a bit weird um, to sort of see maybe there was a bit of a m- mixed emotions within the cockpit. But 
as the race progressed in and of course after the incident and everyone got back to go racing and that um uh, the ra- the racing improved and i felt it was a really good race between the guys and it was something that i think the fans so- fans enjoyed and especially with like, so what happened in f1 as well we had a good we had, it, the sunday produced some good racing and i think you know antoine would have enjoyed that uh a lot more and yeah i mean a lot of people i can understand from the driver's perspective fiver's view that maybe you know they have a bit of mixed emotions of what happened before but at the end of the day you know they're racing drivers they love they love the thrill of racing against one another at high speed so uh, yeah i'd i'd say you know the racing today was pretty good from f3 and f1 now, before we go on to talk about should there be some safety improvements, what could they be and should there be an immediate reaction? Um, we just, I'm just going to touch on Juan Manuel Correa, who Alex has already mentioned. Um, his condition at the time of recording, the latest update is that he's stable. He's in intensive care, and but he has had surgery believed to be for his two fractured legs, um, not for the spinal Dan damage or injury um but hearing that he's stable at least that's got to be good news hasn't it alex um that really does show the test of medical technologies as well um the fact that the marshalling team were able to respond as they did um and to get Juan manuel over to um the local hospital which is based the main chu based in liege um, not too far from, from Spa. Um, so to hear, it is a, a, a comfort, but then the the thing is, is that when Juan Manuel is informed of what's happened, if he has been, but obviously that depends on, you know, whether he's coherent because they would have pumped a lot of um, you know, antibiotics and, you know, uh, and the anesthetics as well so have time to wear off. But then the... The thing, the first thing that he will ask will be, "Is everyone else okay?" So you've got to see it from his perspective how it could affect him, um, and then his rehabilitation uh, is another key point here that we we can't really not talk about because it can't. It takes a lot to come back from such um, hefty surgery, uh, especially with the fact that the two main body parts that control the brake and the throttle are the ones that he's had to have operated on. Uh, but in some respects, I'm really, really glad to hear that Juan Manuel is okay, that he's stable. Um, and it's been great to have the, the, the FIA Formula 2 Twitter and Facebook accounts have been keeping people informed, as have the Sauber Youth Team, uh, the Sauber Junior Team, uh, which also has the likes of Dexter Patterson and Karting on their books, uh, as well as... Um, as well as uh, a few others, I think uh, Callum Eilots in that as well. So it's it's really good to hear that we, we are getting regular updates, even though there may not be anything to update us about. But the fact that we know that Juan Manuel is is, is stable, he's okay, he's going to recover from these injuries. But then the, the mental trauma is is the biggest question that a lot of people will have. You know, how will he cope? You know, will he see the footage? Because he'll probably want to see the footage too understand what happens because in an accent of that type the the amount of adrenaline the amount of shock that goes through your system especially when you're pulling up you know you, uh, let's not forget Kimi Raikkonen's accent a couple of years ago at Silverstone that was quite a hefty impact and a heck of a lot of g-forces and the same could be said for Juan Manuel where he probably won't remember anything about the accent and then wake up and realize where he is and Aaron, how important is it that we don't forget that Correa was involved in this accident, that we don't, I don't know better where of saying it, but we don't get caught up in only talking about Antoine, that there was another driver involved. And obviously, Giuliano Alessi was involved as well, because he was one of the drivers who lost it going up there, who is sometimes a driver will have an accident in sympathy of the driver ahead of them, who's made a similar mistake. I mean, this could have been far far worse than the hor- horrific situation we've got already yeah absolutely i mean let's not forget that obviously there was lacy involved as well as correa and hubert but also marino sato the rookie who made his debut that weekend as well he was involved as well um 
only played only was in minorly and that but still had uh was involved in the accident but yeah i think it's it's hard especially when a driver like huber has passed away that many people forget that obviously career was involved but i think people are people are people on social media and of course over the of course the, over the next few days and of course in the next few weeks and months as his condition improves and how his recovery goes people will remember obviously career was involved in that and it, it it'll be it'll be hard um especially with the likes of what happens to huber but career and like what alex said you know it's all about what happens going on from here now of course He's had surgery and all that, but he's gone through successfully and he's in stable condition, uh, a hospital, which is a positive, a positive to, to, to start off with. And hopefully he will recover from it from there. But now the next few months, we'll, we'll see what happens on there, whether he'll come back at the end of the year or now, or whether he'll come back next year. It's really, it's really determined on what's on how, obviously how well the recovery is, but also the mental side as well, because not only for the fitness, like from the fitness perspective, but also whenever an athlete goes through a major, you know, an accident or an injury like that, it takes a big hefty uh, hit on the mental side as well. Because, of course, the rehab and all the extra stuff that they have to do in the hospitals and all that, it's it's very hard hitting. And I feel, you know, I hope career, you know, in the next few months has a speedy recovery and hopefully we'll see him back in the paddock sometime soon. But yeah, I think, you know, a lot of a few people will tend to will probably forget that there'll be there was another driver involved but as we get updates we'll get reminded and people will remember that career was involved and he is recovering so on and so forth so we we've, we've talked about the drivers um now what about the track um we know that spa Frank Charm is one of the old school tracks. All the drivers love it. It's like Suzuka in that respect. Um, like Brands Hatch at the moment. Um, you've got Paddock Hill, which is very much like the reverse Eau Rouge. Um, Eau Rouge is one, and Radion, it's one of those complexes that everyone knows how bad it can go. Everyone's had a horrendous accident on the F1 game, I'm sure. I mean, um, we all know what can happen, but Alex is this a time where we need to look seriously at the tracks involved and go you know what some of these are not safe enough we all hate the tarmac runoffs that you get at places like abu dhabi but they're safer they're so much safer it's i think it really does need more than anything an in-depth investigation which the FIA are now carrying out um, after this weekend, and obviously Delara and everyone being involved within F2. Um, but yeah, there, there are circumstances that do require, I wouldn't say like a, uh, I'd say more like a revision uh, of how they can make things safer. And it's not, I mean, uh, the most recent, apart from that, where there was a massive accident um, at um, at the top of Redion, was if anyone remembers when Pietro Fittipaldi joined, jumped into LMP2 and ended up going into the wall actually at the top of Redion and broke both legs, and that stifled his uh, his IndyCar career. But now he's in, now back racing in DTM with uh, WRT. Um, but yeah, there's 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 got to be a a constructive, and I wouldn't say destructive, a constructive look at the tracks that could do with some revisions. Of course, this is going to take time. It's going to take the um, cooperation of the local ASNs, which in, in this particular case will be the Royal Automobile Club of Belgium. Um, so it is it is a case of looking at everything uh, and going over it with the microscope, but having the welcome uh, cooperation of everybody involved, from the circuits to the promoter to Formula One. It needs to be a unified stance on it um, and to work from there rather than sort of having a knee jerk reaction saying, oh, we need to do this. We no, it's going to take time. Um, nothing gets solved overnight. It is a very, uh, it's, and having these old school tracks on Formula One is part of the allure for the drivers, but also for the fans. So you've got to take a lot into consideration when you're talking about spectators coming to the track and 
you know, wall to wall down the Kemmel Strait, uh, especially the, the the Dutch Tifosi, as I'm going to nickname them. You know, the the uh, the uh, the Dutch crowds in Orange, where they bring the old uh, orange smoke bombs and um, cheer for their good old Max Verstappen. But they they need to take a lot of factors into consideration. Uh, but we've had some great moments going up, say, oh, you, oh, Rouge and Radion, when Mark Webber went round the outside of Fernando Alonso a couple of years back in a Red Bull. Um, so there's the allure, but then you also um, you also have to look at it from a strategic point on uh, the economies of scale uh, for the for the circuit operators, whether the RACB will get involved to help or whether the local ASNs will do that. It's difficult to say. But I think there will come a time when Formula One will have to put their, their, their foot down and say, right, we still want you guys on the calendar, but we need to work together to come up with a commonplace goal where everyone's happy. We're happy that the track is secure, safe for the drivers to compete at the speeds that they are competing at. Um, but, yeah, um, there will come a time. I think this is probably one of the first times where it has brought it into prominence now. But it's dependent on how detailed the investigation is following the with Antoine, Juan Manuel and everybody else in F2 um, to, to see how it proceeds from there. Well, if you could both give me, we've said we gut reactions are not necessarily the best thing or the most helpful. But in one word, if each of you could just give me your opinion Will Spa still be on the calendar for next year because it's only a provisional calendar, or will it be given a year off to sort whatever this the findings of this investigation may be? Um, it it's a tough one. I mean, they have a contract, and obviously the circumstances are this; they have to readjust to it. I mean, I'd I'd say they'll still be on the calendar next year. Um. I can imagine they'll review the changes, but they need to tap. They need time. They can't rush it and say, "Oh, this is what you need to do." And so so forth. They need time. Um, they had time to when the Jules Bianchi incident happened. They had a, like a month long investigation, and they come to the conclusion at some time around 2015 or 16 on this what happened, so on and so forth. And they push to the, and they find a solution. And of course, that happened with the same with Justin Wilson incident back in IndyCar. Then that led to the concept we have now with Halo, and that, that played a big part with the similar accident accident today. Um, but I think the track safety you do it needs to be involved. It needs to be involved, and the Spa needs to have a look at what it does, what it does in the future, especially with Oruja Radion. But it's a legendary corner. Of course, it's iconic. We've seen legendary moments such as Alex and mentioned that, but we've also seen accident as well. And we need to find, they need to find a way to sort of improve that corner safety because over the last few years, we've seen terrifying accidents to drivers and they've managed to get out uh, at that. But I think, you know, with what happened this weekend, they need to have a look at it. They need to review it and they need to find a solution, but not a knee jerk reaction where they have to they rush into a reaction and then that could lead to, to, to worst case scenarios or some other, so on and so forth they need to they need time to investigate it but if it needs but will it be on the calendar next year i i very see it could be on the calendar and alex have you got an opinion on that yes i agree with aaron there um i think spa will still be on the calendar it is a main save one but as Aaron said, I'm not going to you know, hate everything, but it's just that, yeah, the investigation needs to be detailed, needs to be done at the right pace. But I'm sure we'll see Spa on the calendar the next season. Um, before we speak briefly about the race, remembering that there was actually a Formula One Grand Prix that took place this weekend, um, the final thing to look at really is the cars. And open wheel racing, single seater cars, it's... The inherent weak spot has always been a side impact um, of any kind of speed, let alone what this may have been. Um, is that how can this area be improved other than having the huge bulges on the side to further protect the drivers? They're, they're almost in bulletproof monocoques at the moment. Um, Alex, how how can this area be strengthened or um 
is is this for better minds rather than for speculations such as us? Unfortunately, uh, as a commentator, I don't really have the technical um, in some respects, but um, I'll try and give a sort of a layman's terms what, what I think needs to be done. I think it just needs, there needs to be further reinforcement because obviously, yeah, they, they're in, you know, it's a carbon fiber, sha- you know, monocoque with, sha- you know, the components. Um, but I think it's, it's down to um, Delara and F2 to work together on a solution where it can be somewhat, I, I wouldn't say the term prevented because there are going to be incidents where, you know, nose cones are going to go under the side of side pods and flooring, um, as we saw earlier on in the race, which we'll get onto in a moment. But uh, it, w- one of the things that you tend to see with a lot of cars in racing circles where you have the monocoque and then the engine is pretty much bolted to the back of it, rear axle and suspension. Um, so in case of an impact, what normally will happen, I've seen it happen before, where single seaters, the engine has gone fine to one side because of the sheer volume of the Im- the, sh- the sheer impact. But it's down to the manufacturers of the chassis, which is Delara, uh, and they need to work on a technical solution, which I wouldn't have anywhere, uh, any way in which you know where to think because I'm not technical. I'm sure that there's probably technical people within the Formula One. F2 and F3 paddocks that may be able to extend on this theory. But I think it's down to um, F2 and Delara working together towards a common goal, of making sure that that weak spot is mitigated as hugely as possible so we don't see anything like this again. And right, as I say, there was a Formula One Grand Prix, um, and we'll speak about that for a little bit. Um, Charles Leclerc took his first victory in the category um, and instantly dedicated the win to his friend Antoine Hubert. Um, Alex ha- or Aaron, we'll go to you first. How happy did that make you to see or how satisfied was it to see that Leclerc of all people won on this day? Uh, it, it was really happy. I was really happy to see Leclerc uh, take his first victory, but also dedicated to Antoine and that, of course, Back when the two started kind together, it was the likes of Leclerc, obviously Hubert as well, but Ocon and Gasly all started kind together. Um, they all raced with each other, and it was it, it felt right that we, the right winner was someone who had a relation with Antoine, and and he done it, and he done it in a really good way. He dominated the first in the race until up to the point where they got to the pit stop window. Ferrari could have made a good call on letting. Sebastian to tell him to move out of the way, let Charles go, and then played the clever call of Vettel acting as the pl- sort of like a brick wall in a way to prevent Hamilton from getting past uh, as a few laps to buy Leclerc some time. And then towards the end of the race, he got a little bit more tense, but Leclerc, I think, I believe he had the job done. Uh, I think it was like about a two second gap anyway towards the end of the race. So I, I knew, I, I had a feeling Leclerc was going to win either way. Um, but yeah, I think the right man won today and it was fitting to have a guy who had relations with Antoine to win the Grand Prix and dedicate it to him, of course, I'd say, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the racing today was actually really, really good. Um, it wasn't as far as like the last four races and that, but I think for today, over what happened a lot of the weekend, it, it was it was, it was was the race that we all needed. And Alex, you've already mentioned it, the instant this, the, from the start of the race, um, obviously going on t- into La Source, um, the drivers typically are always compacted together. It was nothing compared to last year's accident where, again, the halo was called into action. Um, but we had uh, Max Verstappen diving down the inside of Kimi Raikkonen. Raikkonen couldn't really see him because the mirrors, as we all know, in F1 are particularly useless. And the two came together, resulting in Verstappen getting some suspension damage. His steering was damaged, so he couldn't make it up by Rouge. Um, he was out on lap one, and Raikkonen was left floundering with floor damage and all kinds of problems, uh, eventually coming home 16th. But talk us through the accident. Well, um, Verstappen bogged down at the start. Uh, Raikkonen got a little bit of wheel spin, and then all of a sudden between the pair of them comes... Uh, newly re-signed Racing Point uh, F1 team driver from Mexico, Sergio Perez, uh, spits the pair of them, 
Um, and then, well, uh, uh, well, um, and then Verstappen thinks, yeah, I'm going to go up the inside of Kimi. And I thought, oh, don't tell me the old Max has resurfaced. And lo and behold, it, it was, um, it was one of those moments where I thought, well, thank goodness we've had a start line incident and it has not called the halo in. Because uh, I think the term that I'm going to use is that Kimi Raikkonen was pushed into a Knight Rider ski mode moment, thanks to Max Verstappen um, going on the round of the outside of La Source and had floor damage. Um, but yeah, I think because of the fact that Max, you know, he's he was fighting for second in the championship, let's not forget. Um, so, uh, and... I wouldn't be at all surprised if that was if that incident is that if that's being called a racing incident by the stewards or whether Max is going to get a grid penalty for Monza. Uh, it was called a racing incident and it was deemed that there was no investigation necessary. OK, good call by the stewards there. That was uh, so at least my first choice uh, of wording there was was pretty much on the ball. Um, but, yeah, it, it meant that um, we, we got one of the best, I think. Um, a really good drive from Alexander Albon. Um, I think one of the drivers that really, really performed and obviously being promoted to Red Bull whilst Pierre Gasly was demoted back to Toro Rosso, um, that the uh, the Anglo tyre driver started from 17th and finished 5th. So Dr. Helmut Marco's um, trust in the uh, youngster, you know, this is pretty much a, re- a, a repeat of when we saw Max Verstappen replacing Daniel K- uh, Kvyat. Um, you know, so we, you know, that's uh, the most recent other Red Bull swap to Toro Rosso swap that we've seen. But yeah, Alex, I think, um, and he did a Danny Rick over Danny Ricky going through the corner with no name um, part way through the race, uh, you know, and had caught up with him through the Kemmel Strait and just went, oh, I'll, I'll try it up the inside here, uh, and then went round the outside of him. Uh, and that definitely got the uh, the guys in the Red Bull garage all fired up because he uh, he ended up taking fifth at the end, uh, despite what happened to Lando Norris, which was a real shame after a great performance from the young McLaren driver. And Alex has just mentioned uh, um, Alex Albon. Um, incidentally, with Verstappen's retirement, his first after a 21-race streak of finishing in the top five, which is incredible, um, Alex Albon has already equaled the total times that Pierre Gasly beat Max Verstappen as his teammate. Um, <laughs> on his debut. On his debut, <laughs> yeah. So he, cho- he chose a good time. But in all seriousness, Aaron, how impressed were you with how Alex got to work with that with that car? Um, fair enough. He started 17th, but he, he managed to finish 5th with a real balls-to-the-wall move against um, Sergio Perez on the last lap. Absolutely. I think that's, you know, that's got to be considered one of the drivers of the season. You know, in the in the time frame that Alex had to get used to the Red Bull car, especially around Spa, it's a unique track in its own right. And he had a yes, he had a grid penalty, started all the way back, but then to come all the way through the field and make some amazing overtakes against uh, throughout the field, calling his way through the field. And then at the last lap to pass Sergio Perez down the Kemmel straight, literally half the car on the grass. Ball is uh, absolutely amazing. Um, he, he's he's really showcasing. If this if we get something like this on a regular basis, then sign him on, sign him on for next year. I mean, that's you 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 want those sort of performances week in week out from Albert. And if he's doing that from starting all the way down to seventeenth, heck, what's he going to be like when he's starting at the front, like sort of against the Ferraris, the, the his teammates, the Staffman as well, uh, against the Mercedes? Or what, what's he going to be like up there? And it's just it showcases again, like throughout the whole season, like he's done so far at Toro Rosso, um, what a sensational talent he is. And I think you know, if it wasn't for the likes of Lando's performance as well as the Clark as well, he would have been my driver of the day, I'd say. Now, Aaron, as this is your first appearance on Pitboard, although it is a different kind of Pitboard, we're going to indoctrinate you slightly. Um, one of the usual features that we do after an F1 race is we do a one-word um, description of each team's weekend, how it's gone for them. Um, I haven't got the soundboard that our usual host, Jake Sanson, has got. Um, he chose a fortunate week to be off busy. Um, so we'll go through these. 
one by one. And I think a good place to start is McLaren. They had Lando Norris, who obviously conks out one lap mm-hmm. from the end, but was he was classified as 11th after a very good drive. And then we had Carlos Sainz Jr., who unfortunately did retire very, very early on on the first lap, actually. Um, so, Alex, can you give me, first of all, your one word review for McLaren's weekend? Nearly. <laughs> good choice. Aaron? Botched. Botched. I, I can agree with that. Um, no, my yeah. one word will be unlucky. Um, yeah, because they were. Um, Lando, fifth for most of the race, could barely see anyone. I mean, we're, we're praising Alex Albon for finishing fifth, but he would have been sixth if Lando's McLaren hadn't have given up the ghost. Um, next, we'll go to Alfa Romeo. We had Antonio Giovinazzi, who had actually another accident actually at Blanchimont. Um, one lap from the end, and he finished 18th or was classified 18th, didn't obviously see the line. And Kimi Raikkonen, P16, after his clumsy accident with Verstappen on lap one at turn one. Um, We'll go to Aaron first for this one. What's your one-word review for Alpha? I don't want to be savage here. Crash Stappen. savage as you like. (laughs) Crash Stappen. Because, well, nah. Um, It was... Smashing, I guess. (laughs) No Ironic. Intended. <laughs> and Alex? Damaged. Damaged. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll go for disappointing. Um, after, the whole season really has been disappointing after showing so much promise in the preseason testing. Um, next, we will go to Williams. We had George Russell finishing, finishing in 15th, having started 14th, um, which was a season best for them. Granted, that was because of loads of engine penalties for other drivers. And Robert Kubica finishing in 17th place. And if I just look at the results, yeah, Williams are still the only team to sit, get both cars to the flag in every race this season. Um, so uh, we'll go to Alex first. Can you describe Williams' weekend in one word? Consistent. Impressive, I like that. Um, and Aaron, over to you. Uh, I'd say... Um... I would have gone with consistent, but I can't. I'm going to be different here. I'd say potential, potential, potential. Yeah, I guess they've been showing some potential. They've been improving slowly, getting close to the midfield. Still quite a long way off, but Spa's going to exaggerate that. Um, my yeah, I I don't really know. Um, almost nearly one of those words. Um, they're they're nearly there. They just I think 2021 will be when they come back properly. Uh, we'll go to Renault next. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo, he started, he had a bit a bit of a clumsy start, ended up having to pit at the end of lap one for the medium tyres and tried to go, or he did go to the end of the race on the medium tyres, but dropped like a stone after the safety car came in. Um, and then we had Nico Hulkenberg, eighth place, more points. Um, Aaron, fair weekend? Um, I, yeah, fair weekend, I'd say. I would go with mediocre. In and, the middle. and Alex. Um. Oh God! Now, now you put me on the spot. <laughs> um. I wish I could use two or three. Uh, <laughs> um. Thereabouts. I'll class that as one. That works. Um. <laughs> strategy. I'll go with that one. Um. They had none. Uh, they could have bought Ricardo in at any point, and as we saw from the Mercedes bolt-on new set of tyres, you're going places very quickly. Um, looking up the order, where can we go next? We'll go to Haas, um, or Haas, however way you want to pr- pronounce it. 12th and 13th, again, constant complaining about near enough everything, as usual, from Roman Grosjean. Um, and Kevin Magnussen, in, Kevin Magnussen, the lead of them in 12th. It's another weekend that they would just want to forget. I mean, this whole year... They, Buying off the peg chassis just does not seem to work for them. They they need to do more work of their own. Um, so, Alex, we'll go to you first this time. Backwards. That's all I'm going to say. Reference uh, the amount of times that Kevin Magnussen got passed down the uh, the back straight. What was it? Three cut, three overtakes done on the day in three laps using DRS, and they all went round the outside of him. And then, of course, you had Grosjean's... Um, own way of writing his own p45 he said i'm losing 20ks on the straights it's not possible it's not possible so effectively 
they were going backwards. And ironically, they have the fastest engine in the paddock um, with the Ferrari <laughs> power unit. Um, so Aaron, Aaron, your one word assessment of Haas. I'd say, uh, yeah, bah, let's say backwards. That It's a dropping, dropping, I'll say. They're dropping down the field. They're dropping like a stone. Well, literally, we're Magnuson. <laughs> So backwards and dropping, I'm going to go with complaining because that's all their drivers, especially Roman Grosjean, <laughs> seem to do on the radio. It's great fun to listen to um, and I can't wait for the next series on Netflix because oops, Gunther Steiner is going to be hilarious. Um, have we talked about, yes, we've talked about McLaren. Racing Point, we'll go to them next. Lance Stroll finished 10th, getting a point which I believe he hasn't got me. Then no, this is his 19th point of the season after obviously finishing fourth in the crazy race in Germany. Um, and then Sergio Perez, sixth, an impressive performance from him, passing the last lap by Alexander Albon. Aaron, we'll go to you first this time. I know you've spent some time around the pink cars. Let's have your yep. one word assessment. I'd say uh, flying. They are flying high at the moment. The new upgrades are working brilliantly, especially around Spa. It's it's a track that they enjoyed. Um, but yeah, I think they're obviously getting both cars and the points. Fantastic for the team. So I'm going to go with flying. Yeah, they've got their new, more conventional, not the nostrilled front wing. They've got a more conventional one now. Um, Alex, uh, let's hear from you. Brazen, because it was quite nice to see both drivers fighting for points, and even though it was the lower half of the top 10. You know, Perez was really fired up and also good to see that Lance Stroll was actually able to get, a, a, you know, another, even though it's only one point, but, you know, they were, they were quite brazen sometimes in how they were approaching overtakes and both Perez and Stroll were just two of the cars that went round the outside of Kevin Magnussen. So we've got brazen, we've got flying. I'm going to go for entertaining, mainly for Lance Stroll's move on the inside at um, against Roman Grosjean, where he left it so late that there was almost contact and uh, he was not backing out of that one jot. Um, right, let's move on to Toro Rosso now. Daniel Kvyat finishing seventh, yet another strong performance from him. Pierre Gasly finishing ninth. Again, he's... It just wasn't wasn't a good race for him, really. I know he scored points, but where's the driver that was there last year? Um, we'll go to Alex first this time. Describe it's a double points finish, but I can't help but feel disappointed. Strength, and and I'll tell you for what, because both of them were to perform in those vehicles. Okay, I think one of the biggest points that we have to remember here is that Gasly's had a bit of the beat down thrown to him by Helmut Marco saying you're being dropped from Red Bull you're going back to Toro Rosso so now he's got to prove himself and initially when he was fighting towards like seventh or eighth position he was coming alive and then we saw that Peter off and then Fiat just thought well if if, if Gasly's not going to do anything I'll do something about it and he gets higher up the order at the end of the race and Aaron over to you oh guy um <laughs> I mean, double points finish and all that. Gasly, of course, this is his first race back at Toro Rosso. I think getting a beat down, again a beat down and all that. So I'd say, uh, oh, it's a hard one. It's a hard one, like, like Toro Rosso. So uh, I'd say, uh, I'd, I don't know. I'm, st- I'm stuck on this one. <laughs> uh, I'd say, I'd say decent. Decent, decent weekend all round. And I'm going to introduce you, Aaron, into how harsh we can be on here because I'm just oh, going to no. say rejects. Um, oh. <laughs> because um, we've got Red Bull Racing at RBR and we've now got Red Bull Rejects, also RBR. Um, just just given with an Italian name for a bit of... Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm sure I can come up with something in Italian, but I'm not in the mood for <laughs> translating myself because <laughs> Google Translate takes time. Um, so yes, we, and doesn't always get it right. We will no, no it doesn't, of course. Now no. we'll go on to Red Bull. We've only got the top three teams left to talk about, so we'll go to Red Bull, the third best team in F1 at the moment. Obviously, we've got Max Verstappen, who exited stage left at turn one at La Source, um, literally to stage left. Um, and then we've got Alex Albon, who we've talked about. He had his brilliant performance, finishing fifth on debut for Red Bull. Aaron, give us your one word for Red Bull. Oh, there was 
it's not necessarily a word, but it's sort of like a play on word. Um, if you ever watch Star Wars, and of course this relates to Albon, that I'd say Tie Fighter because they they were he was fighting for his way through the field. I'd say, but um, that's not one word. That's two. <laughs> Does the hyphen count? <laughs> there is no hyphen in Tie Fighter. What? There's not. Is there not? And it's also a. Um, it's not actually a word because if you're a geek like me, you'll know it stands for twin ion engine. It's not a word. Ah. Try again. Oh, for God's sake. Ah, <laughs> uh, I'd I'd say impressive, impressive debut for Albon and his new team. So now we've got a word out of Aaron. Alex, let's have your one word. <laughs> Uh, my word is relating to Alex Albon, uh, which is gutsy. Just how he really came alive. I, th- I think, what was it, lap 20, he pitted for the soft compound tyres, having struggled on the mediums, and just literally just came flying and just decided, right, I'm going to put it all on the line, just show them the trust that they put in me. And, yeah, he was completely gutsy, especially with that move that I mentioned about Daniel Ricciardo. And then we came to the Perez, uh, Perez Albon sprint for fifth. Uh, what would eventually be fifth. But yeah, gutsy performance from Alex Albon, and that's why that deserves it. Well, I'm going to go for the simple one, which I'm amazed is still left. I'm just going to go for Albon. Um, because, <laughs> yeah, what? you can really cheat like this on here. Um, no, I'm just going to go for Albon because he genuinely impressed me. He got stuck between behind Nico Hulkenberg for a large portion of the first stint of his race. Um, on when he was at a tyre disadvantage, but he kept right up with Hulkenberg. And then when he got the softer tyres, he made the most of it and obviously ended up in fifth. Um, so now let's go to the second best team of the weekend, uh, the best team of the year so far, Mercedes. We've got Lewis Hamilton second, who almost, almost got the win, and Valtteri Bottas in third. Hamilton obviously extending his championship lead, and everyone's saying if the race was one more lap, he would have got got past Leclerc, but I'm sorry, the race is only a set distance, so Ferrari got their tactics spot on. Um, one word for Mercedes, Alex. Almost. Almost. Um, is it and... The fact that they, were, they, they weren't close enough in qualifying the pace, um, Hamilton on the pit, pit, wall, pit radio saying, why don't you pit me earlier? Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was all, it was always a case of almost and total Wolf was very, um, adamant with his comments post race saying that, yeah, we, we should have pitted Lewis a bit earlier. So it was a case of Mercedes calling it to what they thought was right, but it was almost good enough and it wasn't quite there. So got almost from Alex, Aaron, your one word. I'd say close. They came close. Close but no cigar. I mean, if they would have pitted Hamilton a bit earlier or something like that, maybe they could have got snatched the win away, but wasn't the case. Um, I'm going to go for my word is mechanics because the mechanics did such a great job to rebuild Lewis Hamilton's car after his crash in FP3 just two hours before qualifying was due to start. Um, and those mechanics is such a great job. They they deserve a shout out for it. Um, I may not be his biggest fan, but hey, they did a brilliant job. He did a brilliant job. Anyone can appreciate a great driver. Um, so now we go to Ferrari. Obviously, Charles Leclerc won his first race and Sebastian Vettel was the team player that no one thought he was by holding up Lewis Hamilton after previously allowing Charles Leclerc to get through un- unchallenged. Um, who thought that Vettel would be such a team player? Aaron, I will have your one word for the final team. Finally, they finally won a race this year. Um, I think finally they got the strategy right. Finally, the clerks won a race. And uh, finally, Ferrari are back, I'd say. And finally, that only win <laughs> is inside Sebastian Vettel's head. Um, Alex, let's have your one word. Um, my word is going to be Monaco. And the reason being is that Monaco is now the 23rd nation that has had a driver win a Grand Prix in its history. And that is just so happens to be Charles Leclerc. So it was very nice to hear the Monegasque national anthem for the very first time. How jolly just, was that anthem? That, that was really lovely. That was, it was so nice to hear that. And then to hear the Italian national anthem, two very, very upbeat, um, anthems, uh, you know, at the podium ceremony, but for a monoguest to finally step on the top step, and it just so happens to be the lad that we've been waiting to win a race in for 
won um, and is the fourth different winner this year, apart from Messrs. Hamilton, Bottas and Verstappen, um, to win a race. And my word is going to be correct. It was just correct that Leclerc was the driver to win this race. Um, it was correct that Ferrari finally managed to do everything. It was just everything was right about today. It all felt right from the moment that I know this is going off topic from just Ferrari, but from the moment everyone did their minute silence before the F3 race, another minute silence again, incidentally with Hubert's mother and brother on the grid um, before the F1. And then the standing ovation from every member of the public from, I imagine it was probably the same in the garages at this point um, on lap 19, because Hubert's race number was 19. Everything was correct. It was just, impeccable from fans marshals teams everyone well done for the way that you've reacted to the weekend sam there is actually one additional word which i think is definitely right and just said because it is a variation of that and the word that both myself and will buxton uh, obviously gave uh, his gracious time to speak to yourself earlier on is the word kismet which basically means it is written to be um and that was what I tweeted literally after the race had finished, saying that I think that Will would approve of my choice of words, saying that it's kismet that Charles actually won the race. So I think on this particular occasion, I think we can make an exception. Yes, we definitely can. And I'll attribute that one to Will Buxton. So uh, there's no cheating going on with two words here. Um, and that is it, I'm afraid, for this edition. Um, I'd like to thank Alex Goldschmidt and Aaron Gillard for giving up their time. So thank you, guys. No problem at all. Thank you, Sam. No worries, man. Thank you for perhaps having me on. And no problem at all, Aaron. And I'm sorry that this has not been the usual barrel of laughs, but given the circumstances, it just didn't seem appropriate to do the usual show this weekend. Um, so thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'm going to leave you with some words from Downforce Radio Chairman Jake Sanson. Thank you and goodbye. I first met Antoine Hubert in 2017 during his first season in GP3. He was a quiet, humble, mild-mannered young man who was very comfortable in his own skin. It was the British Grand Prix weekend and he was still acclimatising to life in that paddock. When I spoke to him, it was like he was a little surprised to be receiving such interest and attention. He didn't really know where to look when I spoke to him. He had no trace of ego or bravado. He was purely a man with an ambition and a passion for reaching the pinnacle of motorsport. We laughed and chatted as if we'd known each other for years, and later that day he went on to finish second in the first race of the weekend, his first GP3 podium. It's sad to think that I would only meet him once more, just six weeks ago, at Silverstone again. I was bemused that he remembered our conversation from that day, and was keen to update me about his previous two seasons of racing and development. He was telling me he still couldn't quite believe how much Renault was showing interest in him, It was, as he put it, like a comic book for real. He was truly humbled by my interest in him and very grateful. He drove the way he carried himself in the paddock. No ego, no bravado, just pure passion. I think if you spoke to people in the paddock he raced in, he didn't really have any enemies, just thousands of friends. He was the kind of racing driver who best represented who we are and why we do what we love. In just two meetings, I genuinely feel I have come to appreciate who he was, and what he gave to the sport. A bit like Gilles Bianchi, he is a man the wider world will never know, but those who truly love the sport will remember as one of its forgotten rising talents, in the same vein as Paul Warwick, Gonzalo Rodriguez, and Henry Surtees. I'm proud to have known him, and call him a friend, if only briefly. I feel we would have become closer if only time hadn't been so short, but I will cherish those minutes we had, and remember him as a man I can genuinely be proud to have known as an athlete and as a friend. Rest in peace, Antoine, and thank you. A tout à l'heure.